never stop chasing the ones you love now is singing the song you've been singing to us love you're a fighter you hold us tight hi welcome to community fellowship church in lancaster pa we're so glad you're joining us on our live stream today you can find us here every Sunday at 9 and 11 a.m. Our service begins in just a few minutes. If this is your first time tuning in, we'd love to connect with you. Click on the link in our description to fill out our connection card to let us know you're here, ask any questions you may have, and let us know how we can be praying for you. If you would like to find out more about CFC, visit our website, communityfellowship.com. Here you can find out about our mission as a church, Download weekly lessons and videos for kids in preschool through fourth grade. Connect with the student community for grades five and up. Find out about upcoming events, getting connected with a community group, and so much more. We are active on Instagram and Facebook. You can follow us at facebook.com slash cfclancaster, and our Instagram handle is at cfclancaster. If you are a regular attender of CFC or CFC Livestream, be sure to download our Alexio Community app to receive our weekly email updates, access our online directory, or give to the mission of CFC. If today's service is a blessing to you, please consider sharing it with your family and friends. You can also click the subscribe button, and if you click the bell, you'll be notified the next time we are live on YouTube. Thanks again for joining us today. so glad you're here. Whether you're in the building with us or online, we welcome you. Um, so today we are focusing on Jesus. I know that we focus on him every week, but Mark's message is really going to dive into who Jesus is today. And we know that at the name of Jesus, enemies flee, people are healed, mountains fall, and we just praise him for his name. In Psalm 27, David is surrounded by his enemies. He's just in a really bad spot, but he knows the secret sauce, right? Listen to this. He knows what's going to get him through those hard times. He says, one thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. That's our prayer this morning. We pray that we will just be able to hold Behold Jesus, lift him high and gaze upon his beauty. So I invite you to stand. Lord, we ask that you make your presence known to us this morning. We know you are here. And so we ask that you minister to our hearts in a way that only you can this morning. Spirit of the living God, Spirit of
hearts, God, through your spirit this morning, God, as we gather and lift your praise in Jesus' name. This morning, as we continue in our worship, we're going to sing a song that we've sung many times here, and it centers around this word, behold, and you see that a lot in scripture, you see that a lot in songs. And this idea of beholding God, it's a simple thing, uh, but it's profound, because when we behold God, when we see him with and ask God to say, God, we want to behold you, we're asking God to, to kind of open the eyes of our hearts to see him more, and when we see him more, we're transformed into his likeness. Let's read this verse out of Corinthians together where we kind of see this, um, this, this truth kind of unveiled before us. It says, now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the spirit. So let's continue to behold him in our worship this morning. Let's make that, that simple word very profound in our lives as we worship this morning.
ask that. God, you would just be at work transforming our hearts. God, as we gather to, in, to be taught, as we gather to worship, to sing, as we gather in fellowship, God, that you just continually be at work through your spirit. God, molding us into your likeness. And we give you glory as your church in song and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you for singing along with us this morning, church. Before you grab a seat this morning, let's just continue that act of fellowship and worship and say hi to somebody around you this morning. Welcome to CFC. I'm Mandy, Women's Ministry Director. We're glad that you're joining us. If you are checking out CFC for the first time, please fill out a connection card on the back of the seats or scan the QR code and let us know that you're here. And you can take your card to the welcome desk on your way out and we have a gift for you. Last week, we announced the names of those who completed the Discover CFC class at the Saturday night service and the Sunday 9 a.m. service, but not the 11 a.m. Because acknowledging their commitment is greatly important to us, here are their names again. Please join us in welcoming the newest members of the CFC family. This fall, the Women's Bible Study is sinking into Genesis, the first book of the Bible. Beginnings tell us of who we are. When we understand our beginning, we understand where we are headed and why. This study spends eight weeks in the first 12 chapters of Genesis, where we will discover a God who is outrageously creative and responds to deep-seated rebellion with unexplainable grace and mercy. It will give us a foundation for our faith and life. This study is unique because it is just the beginning of a journey that we invite you to take with the CFC Women's Ministry and the church at large. In the beginning, we'll set the stage for the January CFC sermon series, The Story of God. The Women's Ministry will follow that series with our spring study, In the Last Days, a look at Revelation. When the two studies are put together, they create the bookends that lovingly hold all of Scripture in between. By studying both, we get to see how God fulfills all that is in the beginning in the last days. And we will grow in our understanding of the storyline of the Bible, which will deepen our understanding of God's number one way to communicate with us, the reading of His Word. So join us on Tuesday nights at CFC, or at a home gathering during the week, or online on your own. Visit our website for more information and to register. The weekend of October 2nd and 3rd is child dedication at CFC. It is a time during our service when parents acknowledge that children are a gift from God and commit to raise them in God's ways. If you would like to dedicate your child, please register at our website by September 26th. We still have openings at our Saturday night and Sunday 11 a.m. services. The Treasures Truck will be in our parking lot September 25th and 26th. Community Services is hosting our next donation collection for the winter season. You can bring any clothing or household items, but winter is our focus. Last weekend, over 77th through 12th grade students and leaders came together to kick off a new student ministry season. We are excited to share with you a brief video from last Sunday night. But before we do, if you'd like to support the mission of CFC financially, you can do so at the offering boxes on your way out, at our website, or by using our Alexio app. Hey CFC, I'm Eric and just want to let you know how encouraged I was by our student community kickoff that happened just this last weekend. We had so many students come out and we just had a great evening of food, fun, even a time of prayer together as we looked ahead towards this next year. If you weren't there, students 7th through 12th grade, we are starting tonight. Every Sunday we'll be meeting from 7 to 8.30 p.m. and we would love to see you there. So take a look at our event. It was a blast. Like just kind of a great time to like get to know everybody and just have fun in like a relaxed environment, you know. I'm probably most exciting about meeting a whole ton of people because it's all the great. This is the good life. Our 
I definitely want to go deeper into the Bible, you know, learn more verses and stuff that help me through, you know, tough times like in high school because it's definitely going to be some of those. I'm just excited to start to learn more about God's Word and get to hang out with people that I haven't seen in a long time. I will tell you tonight, I just counted about 80 students. We were expecting 60, we have 80. And I was talking with one of the moms and I said, we usually have anywhere between 25 to 35 students per group. But I think it's gonna be a great, a great opportunity for both our junior and senior high kids to come together, you know, and, and work with each other and do things together. So awesome to see Eric and his team as they kick off the fall for the students. That is so awesome. Please, when you see him uh, um, after the service or between services, be prayer for him. Uh, uh, just encourage him, him and his team. So, my name is Patrick Kirkham, and I lead the community groups ministry here at CFC. And once a month, we we share one of our equip partners, an organization that we connect with here at CFC that we partner with, that we fund and, and pray for and support. And this month we're going to have Water Street missions and, and you've seen the table downstairs and I've actually asked Bob uh, is going to come up and share with us a little bit about Water Street and the impact they're making. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning, Bob. And My pleasure. Thank you. For, for a lot of us, when we look at Water Street, we look at as a, a, a shelter more than anything else, but Water Street is so much more, it makes such a huge impact in the community. Maybe if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about what Water Street actually does. Yeah, that's great. You know, and actually there's truth to that. We certainly are a shelter. Um, oftentimes, including myself, two years ago, began to learn more about what we do. It was pretty eye-opening, actually. Um, if somebody shows up at our door at our access center, we certainly are there to provide a meal and a place to stay. But our heart is really to see those lives restored that come to us. And so really we're a full facility, full program organization that has opportunities for people to grow, to, to know the Lord, to grow in the Lord, and to be discipled, and eventually to become restorers. Um, and so, um, so we're a little more diverse, I guess you would say, than sometimes people think that we are. Um, and we're also a hand up organization, um, which means that though we want to help you today, um, we want to see uh, opportunities for you to really grow uh, again in that uh, venue of restoration. Um, but in addition to that, we also do a lot of food distribution in the community. Um, we have a, 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 day, a preschool called Wonder Club, which is awesome, um, and a teen ministry called Teen Haven. And then we just birthed a new ministry in college age uh, uh, in our neighborhood called Compass, which is really uh, very cool. So there's a lot of diversity there, and of course, would suggest the website. And I know you've been there with about two years, you say, right? And yeah. I've been at a couple of events where you've been there as well, and I see yeah. your passion for, for Water Street. Maybe you share a story. Tell us a little bit about why you're so passionate about Water Street. Yeah, um, I was just looking as I was listening and, and worshiping, um, and the passage that was used in Second Corinthians, I believe it was, uh, touched on the word transformation, and there are some really key verses, Romans 12, 1 being another one. Um, it is super exciting to be in an organization like CFC that sees transformation happening and that is really committed to that. Um, and our heart is to see the guests that come to Water Street be restored and that eventually they will start to serve others. And so every day when I wake up, it is incredibly thrilling to know that that really is, and it's not easy, I mean, it's actually quite messy, <laughs> as all of our lives are. But when you get involved in those transformational processes, it's just extremely wonderful to see. So one quick story, one of our guests that came um, that um, a lot of medical related problems, I didn't mention our medical services. Um, that's another pleasant surprise for many people to know that we offer full uh, medical services and dental care because we discover that homelessness is very complicated and it's usually actually not about not having a place to live. It's about systemic life issues that are keeping you in a cycle that leave you oftentimes homeless. And one of those are medical related issues. If you can't get off the spiral of medical problems, you often find yourself where you can't pay your medical debts and you just can't get back on your feet. Um, so uh, this particular guest had a slew of those, has lost a significant amount of weight, uh, got diabetes under control, got a job at Home Depot, 
um, and is beginning to share his faith at Home Depot, which is really, really awesome. And so we're excited about stories like that. That is, that is truly awesome. And yeah. we as a church, we want to be praying for Water Street, but we also want to make it, we want to help. We want to reach out and do what we can as we have a lot of community groups, small groups that love to serve as a group and even as individuals. What, is, what are some ways maybe that we could get involved with Water Street and support you in a, in a real way? Thank you. I have a few things to mention. The first might be a little different than what you would kind of expect to hear, but I've got Isaiah 61 up on my phone. I was looking at it while we were worshiping. Um, Isaiah 61 verses 1 through 4 are our foundational verses, our scripture, that we just go before the Lord. It's a messianic passage about what happens as the Lord visits, what the Lord does and brings restoration and lifts up the poor and the afflicted and, and so. And so if you would pray that scripture, that we would see that passage come alive, that we would see the spirit of Jesus at Water Street Mission, at CFC certainly as well. But that is our heart's cry. The picture of Water Street is to see people on their knees before God saying, Lord, may Isaiah 61, 1 through 4 be true in this place. And so if you would sort of partner with us in that respect and pray that passage on our behalf, we'd really appreciate that. Um, another would be that we have a food drive uh, coming up on November, December called Rescue Mission Food Drive. And so many organizations like Sheets and Wise uh, Markets, um, and uh, some banks and so on have dropped, uh, sharp shoppers have dropped points. However, um, small group involvement in this is really cool. So if groups would want to become a part, and we have a chart that has more information downstairs, in the food drive, your group could commit to looking at the list of foodstuffs that we could use, gather those together. Uh, you can use one of our boxes or you can get your own, or two or three. Um, and you could arrange to drop those off at our drop site at the mission, or you could take them to one of the places at our distribution center, whatever. The point being to get engaged. Um, and we need thousands of pounds of food. But the cool thing about Water Street, another thing that we do, when we get extra food, it doesn't rot. We distribute it to other needy organizations in the city. Um, so we're sort of a nice distribution hub in that respect. So Rescue Mission Food Drive would be another one. Website, once again. And then the other would be our winter weather day shelter. When the weather gets colder, the needs get more difficult for people that are on the street. And so Saturdays and Sundays, typically four hour shifts, smaller groups right now because of COVID, honestly, we're just trying to maintain a little bit more of safety, but smaller groups coming for four hour shifts, Saturdays and Sundays, starting in December through April, are a huge ministry in our city. Um, and so that can be done even as a small group or half of a small group or so, but with winter weather, we call it WWDS, it's easier to say. Um, and so uh, that, to be engaged in that with us would be huge, Patrick. And I may, I'm sorry, one last. I just realized, yeah, you had Treasures Market up on the screen a second ago. One of the cool new things for us is a collaboration with Treasures Market where they're receiving our guests as employees. So they're job creating for us. And so they're giving us uh, some uh, funding to help us in the training, we call it Step Up, and then a few of our graduates will go work there. Just a, a very amazing collaboration. Um, and so uh, anything that happens, we have some uh, certificates downstairs for like a discount to go. They have a really cool early market Saturday mornings now. Um, but Treasures in the City is a collaborative with us, and as you help them, you're helping us. Thank that you. That is awesome, Bob. Thank you very much. Sure. And if you don't mind, I'd love to pray for you. And you shared with me also as a brother in Christ that your dad was going through a tough time. You spent most of the, the night actually with him as well. Let's pray for him as well, if you don't mind. Yes. Heavenly Father, wow, it's just so overwhelming to, to see your work right here in our community, Father. And, and we pray that you would spur us on, Father, as a church to, to love and good deeds, to, to reach out and, and to be part of Water Street and what they're doing as they're the front line, Father, so many times with, with, with people that are hurting and and struggling and maybe find themselves for the very first time in their life in, in dire need and they're there. So Father, we pray for strength for Water Street, for their team. Father, we pray for them that, uh, that you would inspire them each and every day, that you would start their day with joy as they serve those that need it most, Father. And we pray for Bob this morning as he's, he's, he's really just praying hard for his father right now who's struggling with his health and, and the end of his days potentially. And Father, you know, we pray for him this morning, that you would be with him, be with their family as well, and strengthen them, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Bob. And uh, this morning we, we, we get to hear from one of our elders. If you've been a part of CFC for a while, you've, you've heard Mark Johnson speak. Mark is one of our elders and he always has challenging talks. And, and this morning he's going to ask us a very serious questions, probably the most serious questions we'll ever have to ask ourselves. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. And for our online crowd, uh, uh, good morning. Um, uh, I know you're, you know, you're really here to hear Bobby, but in reality, you're really, I think, I hope we're all here to hear from the Lord. And uh, my prayer this morning is that you do hear from the Lord. I was... Uh, I walked in this morning, I walked into Mandy Moore, and she goes, man, how do you feel? Do you feel good? I go, no, I feel like terrible. I, I feel like this unbelievable burden. I was going through my notes last night. I burst out in tears, reading through some of the scriptures. I'm driving to church this morning, and this worship song comes on. I start weeping, and then, uh, then we worship this morning, and I start shaking and crying, and I'm like, oh, Lord. <laughs> You know, how in the world am I going to do this if you've got to stop me from crying? And actually, the fact that I cry is kind of a real testimony to the Lord. Um, I had kind of a tough childhood, and uh, for the first, like, 10 years of my life, I never cried. Actually, the first time I cried was when my 12-year-old son got cancer. That's a separate story. He's a young surgeon doing great, but uh, it really made me cry. And I was thinking, you know, how come I never cry? And then I, I did that 23andMe genetic test. Have you ever done that before? So I did the 23andMe, and they tell you all about your genes. And then they say, you have a disproportionate number of Neanderthal genes, <laughs> um, which is actually true. And I thought, well, you know, maybe that's why I'm such a Neanderthal and such a rock. But um, over the years, the Lord has, like, given me a heart. And my wife can tell you that because I was definitely a rock when we got married. So... Um, Many of you know I'm an elder uh, here. Uh, my day job is a gastroenterologist. You know, that's guts and butts. Um, and, uh, but, but today's message uh, has been uh, simmering in my heart for about a year. And uh, where it's come from is, uh, in my extended family, I have quite a handful of folks who started out knowing the Lord and just completely fell away. And uh, I had a really serious conversation with one of my nieces around Christmas time, and we just went round and round and round, and it was cordial, but, and finally I just said, forgive me, Julie. Julie, what's the most important question in the universe? I mean, really, let's just get down to What's the most important question in the universe? And I said, no matter who you are, whether you're an atheist, Jew, Muslim, Buddhist, the most important question in the universe is who is Jesus Christ? And so this message has kind of come out of that, that burden. But I'd like to begin with a story because I think this story like really tees it up, you know, who is Jesus Christ? And it's a story about my dad. My dad was uh, kind of a, a legend in my extended family, and not for godly reasons. Uh, he was a physician. He was fairly wealthy. He was an outdoorsman. He liked to fish and hunt and camp. He was kind of a man's man. Uh, he rode a big motorcycle. He drove a fancy sports car. He cussed like a sailor and was proud of it. He drank. He smoked. He womanized. He was known for sayings like, you don't have to... Uh, agree with me, because uh, you have the right to be wrong. Or, uh, I've already forgotten more than you'll ever know. And that was just kind of who he was. And uh, in spite of his flaws and honestly his ungodliness, I, I really loved my father. But he clearly didn't love Jesus, and he was honestly quite anti-Christian. 
I committed my life to the Lord at a Billy Graham crusade, uh, actually 1973, in a Minnesota Twins baseball stadium. And several years later, I attended Penn State, and when I went to Penn State, I really got on fire for the Lord. The first time I shared the gospel with my dad was during summer vacation. We were at our family lodge. It was a 32-bedroom, gorgeous place nestled up in the Adirondacks, and just the two of us sat alone in the kitchen. And there's a bottle of bourbon sitting on the table, and I start to share Jesus with him. And the more I shared, the more upset he got, and the more bourbon he drank. And, you know, he, he just interpreted my accepting of Christ as a total rejection of him. You know, he would say, you know, why do you need this? And then he would drink more. Uh, who do you think this Jesus is, and, and why do you need him? It was just baffling to him. Shortly after this, he asked me not to come home ever again. He said, he told me, your faith embarrasses me, and it embarrasses me in front of my friends. Don't come home. You can stay at the lodge. Later, uh, about a year or so later, he took my brother and me out in the back lawn. We, were shoot, we, lo he lo we loved to shoot guns, so we were out shooting. And my dad says, I want you boys to know something. Just so there are no surprises, um, you're not my will. We're like, wow, what did we do? Um, no explanation, just you're not in the will. We ba went back in, had dinner, no explanation. I look at Scott, my brother, and I go, man, what do you make of that? He goes, I don't know. <laughs> From then on, I continue to pray for my dad's salvation. Actually, honestly, every single day for 21 straight years. Um, my dad really made things really difficult for us. I eventually got married. I had kids. We bring our kids up to my dad's place, and we'd pray with our kids before dinner. And my dad would go, you're not going to teach your blankety-blank kids about blankety-blank Jesus, blankety-blank. And LaVon goes, my wife, we got to leave. we got to leave. We didn't leave, but that was kind of the environment. Sometimes uh, I would be in prayer groups, you know, various places over the years, and I would share uh, my burden for my dad. I said, man, he is totally lost. Honestly, he's kind of one of those guys that can't get saved apart from a miracle. And uh, once in a while, someone would like really get touched. I'd just share the burden, and then someone would like grab onto it, and the way I saw it is the Lord touched them. And they would just pour out their heart for my dad's salvation, not knowing who he was. And uh, it would be like this reminder, I'm with you, I hear your burden, um, hang in there. Over the years, as my dad resisted, I continued to pray, and terrible things happened to him. Um, he had multiple heart attacks, multiple heart surgeries, a couple of car accidents, one of which was a 19, brand new, restored 1967 Camaro convertible Chevy that was supposed to be mine. He wrecked that up on a bridge after he drank too much um, he had a motorcycle accident, nearly went bankrupt, had several amputations, lost circulation in his legs, um, and eventually went into renal failure and was on home dialysis. Finally, he clotted off his iliac artery, which is, you know, right, right off your aorta. And he's up in, up in Utica, New York, and the doctors say, well, you're going to need an amputation at the level of the hip, so, you know, no leg at all. There's about a 50% chance you'll die from this surgery. And honestly, after the surgery, you'll never be out of a wheelchair, and quite honestly, you'll probably never get out of a bed. So my dad, being a physician, said, okay, I'm done. Turn off the dialysis, I'm going to die today. He told my stepmother to call up the kids, so my brother and my sister and I, we hopped in a car in Virginia, and crying and praying the whole, you know, six, seven hours on the way up, uh, we were just saying, Lord, please have mercy on my dad. When uh, I arrive at the hospital, I'm the oldest, my stepmother comes up to me, uh, also a strong unbeliever, and uh, she's like really concerned, and she goes, um, I know how much this means to you, but your dad is not a Christian and he does not believe in Jesus. 
And even though she was an unbeliever, she knew that if my dad died not knowing the Lord, it would, she feared it would be devastating to me. So I leave her and I walk into my dad's hospital room and the first thing my dad says when he looks at me is, it's too late. It's too late. And I knew exactly what he meant. And so I just immediately shared the story of the thief on the cross. And I said, you know, and I'll just read you the passage, uh, Luke 20, 23, uh, 39 through 43. I just have to tell you something cool. Um, at least it's really cool for me. So the story of the thief on the cross is only in the Gospel of Luke. And Luke was a physician. And I thought, isn't this cool that a physician wrote this story? And now I'm sharing this story with another physician, shared by a physician. So Luke can kind of say, you know, I brought one from my, my whatever into the clan. But, so uh, whatever. So Luke was a physician. So one of the criminals who were hanged, you know, this is with Jesus on the cross, who were hanged, railed at him, railed at Jesus, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds, and this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, the criminal who believed Jesus was who he said he was. The, the criminal who was like hanging on that cross, I suspect, somewhat repentant, said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That thief on the cross believed that Jesus was who he said he was. He believed he was the Christ. He believed he was going to go into a kingdom. He believed that Jesus was who he said he was. And that faith on the cross, with no good work done in his entire life, was saved and got to be with Christ in paradise that day. And I shared that with my father, who would be hard-pressed to come up with a particularly good deeds, with no walking faith in Christ, saw the truth in it, and it hit him like a ton of bricks, and he started confessing in his sins, would your mother ever forgive me? Would, your, would you guys ever forgive me? And we go, oh, Dad, we forgave you years ago. And, he, and uh, he just asked the Lord to save him, asked the Lord to come in his life. And even before he died, he calls my stepmother over, and he goes, would you give your life to Jesus? He starts sharing the gospel with his wife. <laughs> and uh, it was so emotional. She goes, yes, yes, she hasn't yet, but she promised she would. And um, I'll hold you to that. <laughs> and uh, a couple hours later, he died. But he died with peace. And uh, for some of you who have kind of some tough, tough family members, I just, I hope that gives you some hope. And um, I suspect every one of us has somebody in here we care about who's lost. And um, don't stop praying. And there's, there's always hope. So... This journey with my father reminds me of the purpose of today's message. In fact, as I thought about my father, I was just, you know, it just, it's the gospel. And uh, so what is the most important uh, question in the universe? Jesus asked the question. Who do people, he was with his disciples. Jesus says, who do people say that the son of man is? And the disciples respond, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, maybe one of the prophets. And then Jesus looks to them and he goes, but who do you say that I am? And we all know Peter, you know, quick to respond, goes, you are the Christ, you are the son of the living God. And Jesus goes, all right, you know, you got it. You know, on that confession, you know, I'm going to build my church. You know, not on Peter, on who is Jesus Christ. He is the son of the living God. So who is Jesus Christ? And, you know, not just who is he to you or... But, you know, like, who is he? He is uh, fixed. In other words, it's, he's unchanging. He's glorious. He's wonderful. He's honestly beyond comprehension. I mean, he made the universe. Our answer is not always the same. And as I think of my own walk over the last 40 years, uh, my view and understanding of him has changed as time has 
gone by and uh, life has been laid upon me, you know, you, your view of him changes because you learn more about him. The answer to this question determines the eternal destiny of everyone who has ever lived, past, present, or future. Think about it. The answer to that question actually affects every single person in this room, every single person on the planet who's ever lived or whoever will live. The answer to, to who is Jesus discriminates all cults, all religions, all worldviews, period. The answer to that question determines how we spend our time, our money, our resources, how we think, how we act, how we love, how we hate, how we forgive. Who is Jesus? So who is Jesus? Jesus asked, you know, who do people say that I am? You know, and they responded, you know, John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But uh, what about today? What do people today say about, you know, who Jesus is? So what I'd like to, let's look at a couple of the, I'm going to call them cults because that's what they are. Let's look at the Mormon church. You know, they're really nice people. I mean, have you ever met a Mormon? They are like really nice people. They're, I mean, at least the Mormons I've met, they're, most of them are really honest. They're, they're like good people. Um, but, but it doesn't matter if they're honest or they're good people or they're nice. It matters is what do they believe about Jesus? Because that is the most important question. So this is what they believe. What do they believe about God? God was once a man like us, who existed on another planet. And then, through obedience, he progressed to the God of his own planet, Earth. And uh, fr taken from their scriptures, not from our scriptures, they have a scripture, as man is, God once was. And the idea is that as you kind of evolve, you can become a God in your own planet, and etc. Totally contrary to scripture. What do they say about Jesus? Well, number one, Mormons believe that Jesus is a created being. He's not eternal. Number two, they believe that he's the elder spirit brother of Satan. Number three, they believe that he was married. He's a married man. All of these are absolutely contradictory to Scripture. Now, maybe not every Mormon believes this, but that's the Mormon teaching. It's contrary to Scripture. It's unbiblical. They worship a Jesus that's not in the Bible. They don't worship who Jesus is, and it matters. What about Jehovah's Witnesses? You know, they're kind of nice. Um, what do they believe about Jesus? Well, they believe that Jesus was Michael, the archangel, arch, archangel. They believe that Jesus was created, and then he created the world. They believe that he died on a torture stake, not a cross. They do not believe that he was bodily resurrected. They actually teach that his body went into the tomb, and then it dissolved, and then Jesus was re resurrected in his spirit body, the man Jesus, the, the body Jesus, is dead. This is completely contrary to Scripture. It's not a biblical view of Christ. And it's a faith uh, in a Christ that won't save you because it's not Christ. What about Roman Catholics? And I want to be really careful here. I, I shared this last night, and, you know, Levant said, you know, some Roman Catholics are Christians and real believers. And I said, absolutely true. So I want to preface this. If you're a Catholic and you're listening to this, can you, can you be saved and be a Catholic? Yes, but there's some problems. Um, so who do the Roman Catholics say is Jesus? Uh, well, first of all, they believe he's God incarnate, that he died on the cross for our sins, he rose from the dead in bodily form, and will come back in the flesh to judge the world. All biblical, absolutely, unequivocally true. It's exactly what an evangelical Christian believes. But what, do, what does, not the average Catholic, but what does Roman Catholicism teach about salvation? And there's the rub. Jesus is necessary for salvation, but not sufficient. Grace is needed for salvation, but grace is not enough. Your works help you earn your salvation. That's a Roman Catholic doctrine. It's contrary to scripture. They believe that salvation is separated into two stages. One, baptism, which is required for salvation. And number two, Final justification, and this is achieved through acts of righteousness, not, not fruits that come out of a relationship with Jesus, but actually acts of righteousness that merit your salvation. That's contrary to Scripture. They believe in a thing called purgatory. You've all heard of that. That's where you go to pay the price for your sins that haven't quite been atoned for. That means that Jesus' blood was not sufficient to atone for your sins. It's contrary to Scripture. What about Seventh-day Adventists? They're really nice, and they're kind of 
Um, if you've met them, most of the ones I've met are pretty godly. And, and I would say in the same way, there are many Seventh-day Adventists that are probably real Christians. But if you hold completely to the doctrine of Seventh-day Adventism, you're in trouble. And so they believe, they believe in the biblical Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God. He's the second member of the Godhead. He was born of a virgin. He prophesied to be the coming Messiah from the Old Testament. They believe all of that. That's orthodox Christian belief. The problem is their view of Scripture. And they had a prophet that the whole Seventh-day Adventist movement was founded on this prophet, uh, Ellen uh, G. White. And they believe that the things that she said has the authority of the Apostle Paul, so therefore it's Scripture. And if you read some of the things that Ellen G. White wrote as Scripture, it's absolutely contrary to the Bible. They also believe, now not every Seventh-day Adventist believes this, but if you hold to these things, you're in trouble. They believe that if you, um, that the Sabbath, of course, is only on Saturday, and that observing the Sabbath, Sabbath on Saturday is essential for salvation, and they actually believe and teach that if you attend church on Sunday like we're doing this morning, it's a mark of the beast. And what about pop Christians? You know, have you guys heard of pop Christians? This is something that's really kind of moving through. It's kind of a contemporary thing. And there's a, and I would say it's more a movement, it's not a denomination, but there's a movement that's going through that just really has an absolutely unbiblical view of Jesus. And Jesus is kind of this amalgamation of Yoda, you know, everybody loves the force and, you know, speak the way he does, and Oprah Winfrey, and kind of like my buddy, all loving, mamby-pamby, nothing strong about him, not demanding, he's kind of like your life coach. And you can kind of take his advice, you know, Take it or leave it. A very soft, unbiblical uh, view of who is Jesus. They have a very low view of Christ. They have a very low view of sin. There's no fear of that. And uh, they have a very, as a generalization, a high view of self. Uh, God's love is, they basically understand God's love without his holiness. Uh, A very unbiblical and and progressive and becoming increasingly prominent. Um, I can name one of them, has a big TV show out in the Midwest, you probably know who he is, but he's a very pop Christian kind of pastor, Joel Olstein. I have no shame in saying that. Um, what about Islam? You know, Muslims believe in Jesus. Um, they believe that Jesus was a prophet of God. Um, some of you may not know, they actually believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. They believe that Jesus was born of Virgin Mary. Um, problem is, they do not believe he is God. He's certainly not the son of God. He did not die on the cross, and he definitely wasn't resurrected. Um, what about the Jews? Um, of course, definitely not the son of God, definitely not the predicted Messiah. They had a, a false view of the Messiah when he came, and they still have a false view of the Messiah, and I'll touch on that in the scripture in a second. And... Um, Of course, they believe he was probably the most damaging false prophet that ever lived on the face of the earth. And then finally, what about Buddhists? What do Buddhists say? Well, Buddhists are like, you know, they're all nice. I have some Buddhist friends. They're friendly, they're peaceful. And they say, yeah, Jesus was a good guy. In fact, Jesus was holy. In fact, uh, he was a good man. Problem is, Buddhists say he's definitely not God and he definitely didn't, um, definitely wasn't raised from the dead. So, no matter what the religion, or cult, they all have a view of God or Jesus. Even if you're an atheist, you have some view of Jesus. But uh, these views are not biblical. And, uh, you know, Jesus was not John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, or prophet, like some have said. He was was far more. So, you know, most importantly, what did Jesus say? Who did Jesus say he was? And uh, what, what did the scriptures say? So let's look at one. Mark chapter 12, verse 36 through 37. And uh, I'd like to give you some context here. Somebody pointed out to me last night that, boy, boy, when you shared that, that was so confusing. I don't think anybody knew what you were talking about. But Mark chapter 12, verse 36 through 37 is taken from Psalm 110. And uh, And people would say, this is an absolutely critical Messiah verse. It's a, it's a critical verse about Jesus. And So Jesus is speaking to the scribes. And remember, they they are absolutely convinced he's not the Messiah. And so, and part of the problem was, is the scribes and the Jews at the time, they had a 
they had it all figured out, like I did when I was in my 20s. I had it all figured out. Now that I'm 63, I realize I know, I'm like hardly know anything. But the scribes had it all figured out. And they knew that the Messiah had to be a king. He was going to be a warrior. He was going to restore the nation of Israel. And that's the way it is. And he was a man. He was a descendant of David, period. But Jesus takes that verse. So if you want some depth, just go read Psalm 110. Jesus takes Psalm 110, and he shows them how short their view of who the Messiah is. So he quotes the first verse in Psalm 110 is this. And Jesus taught in the temple and said, How can the scribes say that the Christ, the Messiah, is the son of David? David himself in the Holy Spirit. So Jesus says, David himself in the Holy Spirit. It wasn't just poetic. David was speaking under the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus actually says that. Jesus says, in the Holy Spirit, David says this. The Lord said to my Lord. The first Lord is Yahweh in Hebrew, if you go back to, to the Hebrew text. And the second Lord is Adonai. Yahweh and Adonai are both Hebrew words for God, period. And so the Lord, the Father, says to my Lord, and he's saying, you know, how can this be? How can David uh, call him Lord? How could David call the Messiah um, Adonai, God, when he's his son? And the point was, because he's way more than his son. He's way more than just this king that's going to be born through the lineage of David. He's actually God. And the scribes could not get that. And that verse is really important. Jesus is God. The Old Testament said he'd be God. The Messiah would be God. And it was just, it blew their minds. And Jesus was trying to help them, some, help them see it. I hope that's clear. And if it's not, go read Psalm 110 <laughs> and pray over it because it's beautiful and it's powerful. Who is Jesus? He's God. John 8, 24, I told you that you would die in your sins for unless you believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. So if you're a Mormon, a Jehovah's Witness, if you do not believe who Jesus said he was, you will die in your sins. Who is Jesus matters. What you believe about him matters. It, it affects your, all of our eternal destinies. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him. Why? Because he blasphemed. He just declared himself to be God. Before Abraham was, I am. I am God. Who are you to say that unless it's true? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Colossians 1.15, my favorite verse. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So who is Jesus? You know, who is Jesus? Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a whole bunch of scriptures. I just, one day I sat down and I just started in Matthew and went through Revelation and I just kind of picked out the bullets of who Jesus is. So every one of these bullets is a scripture. And I just want to saturate all of us with who is Jesus? He is Yeshua, Yeshua meaning the deliverer or savior. He is Emmanuel, God is with us. He is Christ, the anointed one, Messiah. He is Lord. He is Logos, the word. He is the son of God, he used to refer to as divinity. He is the son of man. He was both God and man. He is the son of David. The title, the son of David, indicates that he was the physical descendant of David. And he also had right to 
the kingdom that God promised because he was actually a, a, you know, a blood in the bloodline of David. He is the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the new Adam, the second Adam, and the last Adam. He is the light of the world. He is the king of the Jews. He is the great I am. He is the one who is and was and is to come. He is the faithful witness. He is the firstborn from the dead. He is the ruler of the kings of the earth. He is the one who loves us. He loves you. He loves you. He is the one who has freed us from our sins by his blood. He is the one who has made us a kingdom. He is the one who makes us priests to his God and Father. He is the Alpha and Omega. He is the first and the last. He is the living one. He is the one who is alive forevermore. He is the one who holds the keys to death and Hades. He is the one who holds the seven stars, the angels of the seven churches in his right hand. He is the one who walks among the seven gold, gold lampstands, the seven churches in the book of Revelation. He is the one who will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God, to him who conquers. He is the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. He is the one who will give some of the hidden manna to one who conquers. He is the one who has eyes like flame of fire, whose feet are like burnished bronze. He is the one who will give us who remain faithful, the morning star. He is the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. He is the holy one, who is the true one, who is the key, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. He is the one who has the words of the amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Who is Jesus? He is the one who promises great blessing on those who conquer, those who endure, those who are victorious over the ways of the world because of their true faith in him. Our true faith in Christ is evident in how we conquer, you know, the things of the world. Seven blessings for those who conquer, all in the book of Revelation. He is the one who gives the one who conquers a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Think about it. When you go, when we get into heaven, I mean, it really strikes me. I love this verse because it's how intimate God really is. That when you arrive in heaven, the Lord's actually going to give you a white stone. And on that stone is your new name. And that new name is known only to Jesus and you. It's intimate. You have this thing with him. He's like, you know, you know, this is your new name. And it's just between you and him. And it's the intimacy of God, the intimacy that we'll have in heaven. It's not floating off in some ethereal nothingness, you know, playing harps. You have an intimate relationship with God, and it's promised to him who conquers. He is the one who gives to one who conquers and who keeps his works until the end authority over the nations. He is the one who clothes him who conquers in white garments. He is the one who confesses the name of who conquers before his father. He is the one. He will confess our names before the Father and his angels to those who conquer. He is the one who will write on him who conquers the name of God and the name of the city of God, the new Jerusalem that comes out of heaven, as well as his new name. He is the one who will grant to the one who conquers to sit on the throne with him. He is God. He's one with the Father and the Holy Spirit. He is our Savior. He's our Lord. He's our King. He's our Master. He's our Creator. He's our Sovereign. He's in control. He is holy. He is love. He is to be feared. He is to be worshipped. So you might say, I'm a Christian. I know all this. I know who Jesus is. But is it possible, as a Christian, that we sometimes forget or live like we don't really know who he is? I can say uh, it's definitely possible in my life. Do you ever worry? Who is Jesus? Do you have financial troubles? Who is Jesus? Have you been betrayed? Who is Jesus? Has someone hurt you? Who is Jesus? Are you struggling with a sin? Who is Jesus? Are you struggling? Are you having a hard time forgiving someone? Who is Jesus? What does the Lord want of me? Who is Jesus? What is my purpose in life? Who is Jesus? And um, does that sound trite? You know, when little kids, you know, when you have your little kids and you know, what's the right answer? Jesus! Does it sound trite, you know, as I'm say, sharing these things? Yeah, and what about suffering? How does, how does Jesus 
uh, how, do, how does who is Jesus relate to suffering? Does who is Jesus answer that? And, and I thought about it, and I think, you know, without exception, the most godly people that I have personally ever met or who really know the Lord have all experienced suffering in some way. Name me some, think of someone, think of someone who's like had this easy mamby-pamby life. They're just, it's just, it's hard to be close to the Lord if you haven't had suffering. But boy, show me someone who's suffered in some way. And there's a million ways to suffer. It draws you near. There's just no shortcut to become a godly person apart from suffering. And uh, I think it's so important that we, that we get that. You know, Christ suffered. And Christ suffered before the cross. The scriptures tell us that. It says in Hebrews, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And this was way before the cross. So if Jesus suffered, you know, why shouldn't we? So who is Jesus? And so whether you're filled with joy or sorrow or you're, you're blessed beyond measure, being continually mindful of who is Jesus is powerful and transforming. He is God. He loves you. He is your strength. He is your joy. He is your life. Honestly, he's your everything. And what I'd like to do is just close in prayer, but I'd kind of like it to be a meditative prayer. There's, there's three questions on the board. And let's just take a couple minutes and just ask the Lord to reveal to us what we're talking about tonight or this morning. So please pray with me. Lord, is there some aspect of who you are that I need to see, that we need to see? Lord, is there some aspect of who you are that we need to see? Please show me. Please show us. Please reveal yourself more to us and grant us to know who you are in a, in a deeper way that transforms us and is reflected in the way that we, that we live. Lord, is there some area in my life that reflects that I do not believe who you really are? Is there some area in my life that reflects that I don't really believe who you really are? Please show me. Please show us. Lord, please help me surrender this area of my life to all that you are. Please help us surrender because you have revealed to us who you are. We trust you. We love you. We belong to you. You you paid an unbelievable price for us. I ask that the things that are from you will sink down deep into everyone's heart and it just will echo in their minds, in their heart throughout the day and the week. And the things that aren't from you, I just pray that they'll quickly evaporate and just not even be in memory. Together we ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus, our only hope, the King, the Master of the universe who's coming back. Please help all of us be ready for when you return. In Jesus' name, amen. We invite you to stand as we continue in worship, as we claim Jesus as our living hope.
Here's us close and be reminded of this truth. That God so loved the world, he gave his only son. His name is Jesus. Let's worship him this morning. go in that truth and go in that freedom to serve and love him. Amen? Amen. Have a great week. We'll hope to see you next week.